Everybody, it's Larry Sharp here at the governor's house, and behind me is my daughter. Barbara is here tonight. Hope you guys uh, want to say hi to Barbara, say some cool things. Don't be mean to her. She's my daughter. She's a kid. Um, so, yes, I am here this evening. If you want to talk to me, 877-480-4120. Talking tonight about education and also talking about race. It is Black History Month. I thought that would be an interesting uh, topic to use. So if you want to talk about that, I'm happy to discuss that. 877 480 Four one two zero. You know, when I was a kid about 10 years old or so, my family moved out of the Bronx. I was raised in the South Bronx. We moved out to Long Island, out in Suffolk County. When we got out there, we went to a local public school because that's what you did. We went to a public school and, and it was several weird things to me as a city kid that I had to deal with. The first one was when I got in, they wanted me to uh, be in one of the classes, right? Which class am I going to go into? My father said, no, my son Larry, he is in the highest class in city school, so you got to put him in the highest class in your school. The principal said, yeah, we could, but no, you know, city kids don't do well here usually. City kids. I didn't know what city kid meant. I know what city kid meant now, but then I didn't know what it meant. So my father, of course, said, wait a minute, this isn't fair. You need to test him now. And the principal said, no, 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 no need to test him. We'll put him in a lower class, a low class, and he can work his way out. So I want you to realize something. I, at the point, this point, had great grades. Not only did I have great grades, I also was able to test well, and still they wanted to put me in the lower grade. Why? So my father made him test me. Tested me. Once we, we got tested, I scored high. He put me in a higher grade. Guess how many people of color me and one girl now am i saying that they were racist i'm not am i saying that they were purposely bad at trying to hurt me i'm not what i'm saying is that's what he felt was the right thing to do and sometimes people are racist sometimes they're not so i just think it's the right thing to do just because someone makes that assessment doesn't necessarily mean it's bad or good it could be institutional it could be the individual i bring that up because we often have that problem and one special thing that happened, which kind of puts the race together with education, is recently in the Bronx, there was a problem with a teacher who was trying to teach a lesson about slavery. And when she was doing this, she took some of the kids and she had them get on the floor and she didn't like slaves. And she's a white woman and many of her students were black or Hispanic. And she actually was trying to teach them this and she actually put their, her foot on one of the kids when he tried to get up. And oh my God, the world's ending. Oh my God, now she's gonna be put on suspension. Oh my God, the world's ending. Now, in case you didn't know, I'm a person of color. If it was my child, would I be upset that she put her foot on my kid? No. Why no? Because this is one of the things that would actually make someone understand and remember something. This is a teacher who is trying her best to do the right thing. Is she a racist? I don't know, but I doubt it. That in itself is not racist. It's far worse the guy telling me, oh, city kid, go to the dumb people class. That's far worse than some woman trying to teach someone slavery is horrible and you don't get to have any rights and people can literally put their foot on you and stop you from getting up. You have no freedom. Perhaps she was wrong. Perhaps it was too far. Eh, maybe. Maybe. But does that kid remember that? Oh, yeah. Do people now remember that? Oh, yeah. Did the kids actually learn something? Oh, yeah. So why in the world would we punish her? If we look now at her record, right? Does she have a bad record of hurting people? Her record is everybody loves her. She's a great teacher. So why in the world did we decide to make her a bad guy? And I'm going to go one step further. Why didn't someone step in? Why didn't the mayor step in? Why didn't the governor step in? Why didn't a congressman step in? Why didn't an assembly person step in? Why didn't someone step in? And here is my problem. No one steps in because no one steps in. That's the reason. The one guy or gal who steps in, if, if that teacher has something wrong in the future, is gonna be attacked and they have no air cover. This goes back to a problem we have in politics, but heavily here in New York State. No one's responsible. No one's in charge. 
No one's there to say, that's wrong, stop. And that's what I want to do. So do I know what the right answer is for education? It's a great question. Here's what I know. Experimentation is the answer. Innovation is the answer. The same old things are not the answer. We have schools in New York State that have a 47% graduation rate. I'll say it again, a 47 graduation rate, 47% graduation rate. For the people of color, sometimes the graduation rate is less than 10%. I'll say it again, less than 10%. Why in the world are we worried about, let's just put more money at the problem? How about whatever they try? Whatever they try is better than 47% graduation rate. You know what? Step on all the kids. Step on every one of them. Just graduate. Learn something. Learn how to think. Learn that slavery is bad. Anything. It's okay. The status quo is failing. Clearly, there is no doubt. And the answer is more status quo. Huh. You know, these problems are bad. You know what we should do? Give these problems more money. Oh, everything we've done has failed. What should we do? Give it more money. Let's reward terrible behavior with money. That's what we're doing. So am I defending this teacher? Yes, I am. Absolutely. And if she does something bad in the future, you'll get mad at me. And I don't care. I don't care. It is critical that teachers who are trying to be innovative, the teachers who are trying to do something special, trying to be memorable, make impact, we should support them. And when they make an error, say, hey, you probably shouldn't have put your foot in that kid. But it's okay. You're not fired. You're not punished. Keep going. And when the parent says, she put her foot on my kid, look at that kid and say, she's teaching your kid something. Stop. Stop. The world's not going to end. She's teaching your kid something. Stop. Have you seen your kid's peer group? They're not graduating. Be happy someone cares. Stop. And that does not make parents happy, I know. But I'm a parent, hence I got one right behind me. Yes, yes, total prop. I know I'm a bad guy, total prop. Doesn't matter, I still use her anyway. Yes, I, and I have another one. I've got a seven-year-old also. She's going to bed, she can't be here tonight. But anyway, I would have brought her too. I so would have used both of them as props. Yes, I would have, in any case. That's what I'm saying. I'm talking trash here today, not as some guy. I'm talking trash here today with, as a parent in New York City, in New York State, who's had kids both in private school and public school. And if this happened, I'd be okay with it. I'd be the one supporting that teacher. I'd be the one in the principal's office saying, stop, leave her alone. And as governor, I'll say, stop, let teachers teach. Here's the thing. The more we control teachers, the more we control them, the more the bad ones are able to hide behind policy and the good ones are stifled. The more we let them go, the more the bad ones will come to the forefront and we can get rid of them and the good ones will shine. That's how it works in everything. Education too. Shine a light on this and you will see things change. Allow teachers to be innovative and to do what they think is right and all of a sudden now you will find the good teachers will become great and others will copy and the bad teachers can't hide. We have spent literally millions of dollars, I'll be clear, no hyperbole here, millions of dollars having teachers sit in rooms and not teach because they're bad teachers and we can't fire them. But good teachers leave. How is that okay? How is that okay? It's not. Now, why am I bringing a race in here? Because people often say, well, the system is racist. Sometimes that's true. People are racist. Sometimes that's true. But whether the people are racist or the system's racist or no one's racist, it doesn't matter. Here's what we do. Shine a light on that too. You want people to not be racist? Let them be racist. You want people to not be bigots? Let them be bigots. Now, I bring this up because being Black History Month, people talk about MLK and all those, and the Civil Rights Movement, and they were amazing, absolutely. But here's what a lot of people don't know. There were tons of people fighting for equality decades before the 60s. Decades before the 60s. Many years before the 60s. What changed? What was so different? Were the people so more talented in the 60s than they were in the 30s and 20s? No. I'll tell you what changed. TV. That's what changed. TV. People actually saw it. 
a light was shined on it. And even people who are racist said, wow, I don't like black people, but man, I don't want to kill them. That's what actually happened. People who were racist thought, eh, I don't like Bible, but I don't want to kill them. Wow, that's too far. We've gone too far. When they saw it on TV and they saw that, they realized, you know what? We've gone too far. And the culture began to change. Shine a light on teachers. Shine a light on education. Shine a light on racist institutions. And if they really are racist, guess what? It'll come to the front if they are. And if they're not, that will stop too. All right. I hope I didn't do too much stuff. Thank you for the prop. Hold on. Georgia, show me your um, barber, show me your shirt. Save Main Street. There we go. There's my prop. All right. We're good. So, yes. Okay. So, anyway, uh, people, let me deal with some questions. I mean, we have any questions, Brian, you want to deal with? Go ahead, please. We've got some questions. People seem to care about education. Go ahead. Uh, Parvin asks, what is your approach to charter schools? This is a great question. And the, the problem I have, I have a worry about charter schools. And the worry is, is this simply a way to increase government schools? That's my concern. Now, as a short term solution, I think charter schools are amazing and we should support them in the short term. But in the long term, we've got to we've got to support even more choice. It's got to be even wider. We have to. It's already happening in New York State. It's already happening. We are beginning. We're supporting charter schools and we are also supporting uh, homeschooling much more than we ever have. I do want to increase the choice. Charter schools are a fine short-term solution, but long-term they're not. Long-term we've got to create actually a system to where people can in some way, shape or form pay into the system to get the, the actual education they need. But more than that, K through 12 has to be completely revamped. Totally, totally revamped. The, re, the, the idea that 15, 16, 17, 18 year old kids are all going to high school supposedly studying AP chemistry and history is silly. There absolutely should be some kids who are studying AP history and chemistry, 100%. That should exist. And some kids should, without question, be going to a trade school. Some kids should be uh, interns with a plumber. Some kids should be off starting businesses. Some kids should be doing other things. So the fast that we can get to a completely revamped K-12 through to include at a minimum, a privatized option at high school first, and then seeing where we can go from there, now we're starting to rock and roll. We're already having that happen in New York City already. Getting to a high school in New York City is very similar to getting to college right now. So we're already working on that already. So I hope that answers your question. Did I, did I answer your question? I hope so. Yeah, good. All right, if I didn't, please post it. I hope I answered your question. All right, we have to go on a quick break. After that, I'm going to come back with some more race issues, education, and also, believe it or not, I'll probably touch something uh, that you don't know. Uh, you ask any questions, and I'll touch it. Give me a call, 877-480-4120. It's Larry Sharp. I'm at the governor's house. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you stuck in a rut? Negative thoughts, feelings, and conversations got you down? Hi, I'm Noreen Sumter, The Potentiator. Tune in every Tuesday, 9 to 10 Eastern Time, and listen for new ideas on my show, Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way, on talkradio.nyc. do you want to connect with? Are you an entrepreneur or intrapreneur looking to build your following? Welcome to our show. Follow, Follow Me Friday, Friday with Joan and Priya. Tune in every Friday at noon Eastern on talkradio.nyc. We're, We're your digital, digital connectors. connectors. Woo woo! <laughs> <laughs> Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day.
And we are back at the governor's house. I'm Larry Sharp running for governor of New York 2018. So please feel free. Give me a buzz at 877-480-4120. And I will answer your questions talking today about race and education. However, I'll talk about whatever you want. And I brought my prop. My daughter, Barbara, is here. Absolutely. So I'm taking a phone call. Who we have on the line? Hey, caller, how are you? This is Charlie. I'm calling about um, a question based off your platform and how you're going to actually fix Can Governor you... Cuomo's folly in our budget, which might not actually be possible for several years. Can you say that one more time? <clears throat> yes, I can fully repeat myself. How do you plan on fixing Governor Cuomo's folly and actually fixing all the mismanagement of New York State within your first term? Yes, it's a great question, and I'm unsure I can do it all in the first term. It's a very good question. There are three things we have to worry about here. The first one is making sure someone's actually in charge. And that sounds crazy, but in many cases, no one's actually in charge. The Board of Regents has a lot of say. Different boards have a lot of say, and they get budgets, and they create laws and rules. And all of a sudden now, we have unfunded mandates, and people simply have to find money to pay for these mandates. Happens throughout the, uh, the counties, happens in the towns. They start using law enforcement right. as, a pro as a profit center. So step one is actually making sure all of these boards are underneath either the assembly, the governor, or the chief justice. That is step one. Step two is ensuring that we do not accept that 2% growth in spending is acceptable. It's not. 0% is acceptable. That's step two. 0% growth is acceptable. With that in mind, no new taxes. Those two things together are step two. Step three. And that's absolutely why I support you. you oh, thank you. Absolutely what you're selling. You're selling, what you're selling is absolutely perfect and what New York needs. New York needs to get back on track. Almost folly, it should not cost me $18 to go over the G GWB. Yes. $18 to go over the Tappan Z. Yes. $18 to go over the Frog Smack. It's ridiculous. I completely agree. Yes. And the next thing is you'll hear him always say this. This goes right in line. He's talking now, and he's brilliant in this. He says, what we need now is revenue enhancers. You might have heard that before. We need revenue enhancers. Revenue enhancer means tax. That's what that means. Yeah. Tax. Revenue enhancer yeah. sounds awesome. What a great word. Well done. Governor, well done. <laughs> it's not a tax. It's a revenue enhancer. Come on. Love it. <laughs> But when I no, say revenue not, enhancer, that's not the answer. The answer is actual responsibility and management. Well, the 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 issue is when I say revenue enhancer, I actually mean revenue enhancer. You probably heard, no. I'm talking about things like naming rights on bridges. A naming right on a bridge takes the toll away, which is an actual benefit to a middle class New Yorker who drives, who's paying those tolls. Now, Verizon or Sprint or McDonald's or insert company here that already spends three, four, five billion dollars a year on marketing will happily drop 10, 20, 30, 40 million on a bridge. They're going to get their name mentioned every day on the bridge, no tolls, and they're responsible all of a sudden for maintenance. So not only do tolls go away, but revenues enhanced and the bridge is now their responsibility. There are over 12 bridges just in New York City run by the MTA. Can you imagine that times 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars? Plus the absolutely. tunnels. Absolutely, I pay the subway every morning. You get it, absolutely. Why are we doing this? This is a real revenue enhancer. We've got the Erie Canal. There's 500 and some odd miles of the Erie Canal that we have that now is not being dealt with at all. It raised about $2 million over the last year. It costs about 100 million to run. That's not a good deal. I'm not a mathematician, but I can figure out that's a problem. We can raise I revenue. That is a horrible deal. There we go. It's getting taken out on the taxpayer and the state residents. Yes, someone's paying for that. And guess who it is? Me and you. But instead, right now, instead, we can take that and make that commercially That's viable. Timeline, also. Uh, good luck running. I'll, I'll hopefully get you a donation soon. Thank you, brother. Soon. That's what I want to hear. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. I didn't finish answering the question. He's already happy. First two. Didn't even need three. I'm that good, guys. I only had to do two of three, and I still won. See that? Awesome. Um, who, uh, I also have uh, Melvin on the line. Melvin, how are you? Hey, Larry. I'm great. Um, I, uh, I missed a little bit of that first discussion, so I apologize if I, if I missed this. But I'm asking specifically about um, 
local school budgets. Okay. And what you can do at the state level, get that under control. Here's the example. My school district uh, this last fiscal year, 730 students spent almost $20 million, and they think that's a good deal. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's other problems related to that. You know, uh, They offer you a budget, and then the contingency budget is sometimes higher. So if you vote down a budget, you get this bigger budget. But some of these things, is there a way at the state level to try to get some of this under control? Yeah. Um, there, are, there are two aspects here we have to worry about. Aspect number, well, I see maybe three if we add a, a larger one. But one of them is simply stop with the unfunded mandates. That aspect is so critical. You have a local community that now has a budget. Its budget, for the sake of, for the sake of argument, is $2 million. 1.85 is mandated. How are they going to possibly make any changes? They're going to have to cut something somewhere. They don't even know where to cut. So the first thing is to give them more flexibility with, with making less mandated things in their budget. Now, people are going to say, but Larry, then they won't have the services they need. I'm not saying that a local government cannot provide the services. I'm saying it's not mandated. Now, if many local governments don't aren't mandated, they may do the smart thing, which is innovate and decide that, hey, government one does this better. Why don't we focus on that and people can travel there for that service or can be controlled by that service while government two does something else better. And all of a sudden now we're not doubling, tripling. The best example is police forces, right? We see it all about upstate New York. There's a state police and then there's the city police and there's a town police and a county police. And they're all policing the same thing. That's step one in the schools making the budgets freer so the local school districts can make choices within their school. But the next one is actually letting the, the, the schools decide who they hire and when. Now, this is controversial, and some people don't like this. But the idea is, why am I forcing a school to hire a certain number of administrators or teachers that I mandate? If you've looked, you can see the number of administrators in each school is going higher and higher and higher. And if there's 10 teachers, there's 10 administrators. Why is that there? And the example I use is, and this is similar, the example I use often is doctor's offices. If a doctor's office takes insurance, you will have two doctors and five administrators. If a doctor's office does not take insurance, you will find five doctors and two administrators. Right. So the same thing in our schools. We have so much paperwork and red tape that is mandated, they have to have administrators to cover these things. This is where our expenses pop up. Our expenses go crazy. Instead, I'll let the school go, if you don't want it, don't do it. Now, the point being, you might say, but Larry, some school's doing well. I'm not saying they can't, and this is the issue. I'm not saying a school cannot. I'm saying they don't have to. If what's working in your school is working, please keep it. If it's working, don't stop. If you've got high graduation rates, happy parents, happy kids, kids who want to go to college, going to college, kids who want to go off to the military, go to military, kids who want to go off to work, work. If that's happening in your school, please don't change. Don't let me get in your way. Ignore me, please. But if your schools aren't working and you think I should try something different, try it. I'm not going to enforce it. Yes, it's the law. Fine. It's my least important thing. It's my lowest priority. So those two pieces are allowing the local, local uh, governments to be able to be free to change their budgets the way they want, and the second, allowing the schools to not have to have those administrators and follow those rules also. Again, not saying they can't. If it's working in your school, take it. And you're going to say, I know people will say this all the time, but Larry, then kids won't get good education. They're not getting it now. That's right. They're not getting it now. Yeah, that's right. If we at least innovate, we can actually come up with a long-term solution. Here's what I'm sure of. People who care come up with good answers. That ha that's a fact. People who care come up with a good answer. Now, here's the most important piece. If you're in trouble in any way, shape, or form, whether you're f physically in trouble, financially in trouble, emotionally in trouble, insert thing here, you're in trouble. The first thing you need is not a doctor, is not a policy. You need a person who cares. That's the first thing you need. If you get a person who cares, then you will get whatever else you need. If we, uh, look, people get mad at teachers. The problem is they have two separate uh, ideas. One is, oh, teachers are lazy and blah, 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 and terrible. And the other one, oh, teachers are amazing and awesome and they're perfect and saints. They're neither. They're just people. Right. They're neither. But most of them, and I know this, most of them are dedicated 
and really want to do the right thing, that's why they went into teaching. So I have an idea. How about I don't think that I know what's right for every student. How about I don't think that some bureaucrat in Albany who's appointed by some guy who a crony capitalist who knows what's right for every student. How about instead I just let those teachers teach? Let them teach. And what I'm sure of, and I'll bet this, and it's on a record now, if we let New York State teachers teach, they will find the right answers that we can now copy. We may not know how to deal with kids who have special needs as well as they do. They'll figure it out. They're in the room with them. They will find the answer. How to deal with poor kids. They'll figure it out. They're in the room with them. They'll tell us what's going to work. Is it about them eating? Is it about them talking? Well, I don't care what it is. I remember there was one uh, school that actually started teaching. They had a bunch of kids who spoke really bad English. They were either from a, a suburb, I'm sorry, they were either from an inner city or they were really out in the woods or something like that where their English was really poor. They didn't speak standard English. So they taught standard American English as a separate class. There were people like, that's crazy. No, that might be crazy in your neighborhood, but that worked in their neighborhood. That's what they needed. And that's the right answer for them. I know I kind of went off topic, but did I answer your question at least? No, I, th I like your ideas. I mean, one of the things I encounter is that I think that idea of unfunded mandates is used uh, kind of uh, as an excuse yes. sometimes. I mean, Absolutely. The, the, our school district spends money on everything under the sun. Yep. And it's always, that's the always excuse. Well, it's the unfunded mandates. Well, the unfunded mandates. But that's not really true uh, because if there's other districts that aren't spending nearly that much money. So, yes. Absolutely. Um, but here's the best part. Once you make them unfunded, there's no excuse. And again, transparency. All of a sudden, when we figure out that, oh, that money was spent because the principal wanted to go to vacation in Puerto Rico, all of a sudden that comes out. I hope there aren't people doing that. But if there are, then that will come out. So I completely agree with you. Yes, that's great. I like the basic plan. I really, I really appreciate it, and I wish you the best in your race. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Look, I have more people calling. Please keep calling 877-480-4120. We'll be back in just a minute. You are listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you into comics, movies, and pop culture at large? What about music and TV? Then you're in for a treat. This is Michael Dolce, your host on TalkingAlternative.com. I've been professionally writing comic books, screenplays, and music articles for almost 15 years. Catch my show, Secrets of the Sire, at its new primetime slot, Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and get the inside scoop on the pop culture universe you love to talk about. For more info, go to secretsofthesire.com. Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day. Welcome back to the governor's house. It's Larry Sharp. I'm running for office, and my daughter is laughing because she put her ears on my on me. So I now have cat ears on my head. There we go. Um, anyways, what happens when you're a dad, particularly when you have daughters? And those of you who are dads, then that's how it works. So, yes. All right. Let me grab a phone call if I could. This is Luke. Luke, how are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. I've got ears on my head. <laughs> I know how that goes. I got a two-year-old little girl. So You know. Absolutely. Did you want right, to talk so to me or you just want uh, to tease my, me about my ears? Which one? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess my question kind of involves, I guess, race and education a little sure. bit. So one of the main concerns when I talk to people about moving towards uh, charter schools and pr more private schools is they seem to think that if schools, you know, basically can choose their students, that mm -hmm. they'll go for, you know, the more uh, smarter kids, uh -huh. the kids who come from more well-off families. Yep. And I work in special education, so... I also tend to see that some of the regular schools don't necessarily want to deal with these kids who have yep. trauma and just special needs, and so they kind of send them to my school or where I work at. Yep. 
So uh, what were your some of your ideas to kind of combat this? Absolutely. There are several, several issues now. And we have an issue here in New York City. The worry is, you know, well, well, what about the special ed kids? I'll, I'll do special ed and race. I'll do both. Let me deal with race first. Um, New York City has one of the, uh, some of the most segregated schools in the nation. Yes, this is the North. This is New York, and we're segregated. So it's working. Whatever's happening now, not working. So even if that's the case, they just want the best kids or the best kids are, great. I hope they just want the best kids, however they decide that is, because if they actually use something that's not raised like test scores or interviews or essays or insert thing here, then they'll actually won't, they actually won't have segregated schools because, it, as you know, smart people are in every race. So they're looking just for smart people. That's awesome. But what also might happen is there might be what, what's happening in New York, State, New York City already is there'll be specialized schools, schools for kids who want to be artists, schools for kids who want to be engineers, schools for kids who want to be plumbers, schools who kids want to be so-and-so. Again, no racial issue there. If you're better with your hands than you are with math, awesome. If you're better with math than you are with your hands, great. There is no bad issue. So I'm actually okay with this. The issue that will happen is there will be some initial shakeup, and that's true. And people who will be upset, that's true. We need a leader who is going to be able to push through the first one or two years of that. Whenever you make change, there's disruption. And most leaders get afraid of that, and they fall back to their old ways. I'm asking you and everyone else in New York that when we make these changes, changes disruption happens, we'll be okay with it. We'll push through it. It'll be a long-term solution. So even if there is a racial issue, I'm okay with that because it will turn, because it will be about who is successful. Now, on top of that, we can't just say success is test scores. That is a critical aspect. It cannot be just t test scores. It must be things like how many kids go off to college who want to go to college. That's a big, there's a big caveat, not just college graduation or college rates, kids that want to go to college. And how many kids that want to be employed get employed. This type of thing is what I want. I want kids who are happy. I'm not here to tell you that college is your way to happiness. I don't know what your way to happiness is. Maybe it's wearing ears on your head. I don't know. Whatever way you want to get to happiness is how I want to judge that, whether that's going to get a job, going to the military, joining uh, get, join college, getting married and having children. If that's what makes you happy, awesome. If high school and, and, and school did that for you, that's a win. Now, when it comes to special ed, another issue here. You know, there's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, I don't know this, but for kids who have special needs to be together. I don't know if that's true. I'm saying we're assuming that kids with special needs have to be in with kids who don't have special needs. But not just that, how do you decide what a special need is? Where's the line drawn on special need versus not special need, right? And the issue is, let the schools decide. What I know is, as schools bring in kids who are special in any way, they'll get better at dealing with them. That happens all the time. Now, if the government wants to step in to facilitate this, you can facilitate in some way, shape, or form. You can do things like say, if, as an example, if school X takes in X percentage of kids at the school decides is special needs, whatever that is, then they will get a break on this or a break on that or a break on this thing. Somehow, shape, or form, they get a benefit, which means I'm not forcing a school to do this. There's no money I'm giving it it gets a break on money it spends. If that school thinks the break is not worth it, it doesn't do it. If the school thinks the break is worth it, it does. Some schools will pick it up as a way of, of, of saving revenue, and they will find a way to handle special needs kids. Some schools won't. In fact, some schools, I'm sure, will, be, will become special needs schools. And again, what is success for a special needs child? It's different than people who aren't. And each kid who's special needs has different special needs. Even for them, it's different. What I want is success. Did I answer your question? Definitely, yeah. I, the school I work at, I think our biggest challenge is we usually only have kids kindergarten through eighth grade. And that our primary goal is not necessarily academics, but just, yep. yeah, to teach them to be functioning members of society. Because Absolutely. They just don't, they don't act in ways you would necessarily expect. That's correct. And so once they've got then learned what they had to in eighth grade, they do usually go to high school where they can interact with people who are not special needs. And then hopefully they're ready for a job to be a successful adult. Absolutely. And that's what I'm, I'm talking about. I'm not talking about making every kid Einstein. Some kids should be Einstein and good for them. And some kids shouldn't and good for them too. Whatever makes a kid and their parents happy is what I'm looking for. So absolutely. 
So I just want to make sure that we're clear now. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks. Great. All right. I have uh, Peter. Peter, how are you? I'm doing great, Larry. How are you? What's going on? Do you want to talk to me, Peter, or no? Hello. Peter, are you there? I think I'm losing you, Peter. Hello? Are you there? All right. I think, I, I think I've lost Peter. I don't know what happened. Peter, where'd you go? All right. No worries. Hello. Are you there now? Yes, sir. I'm here. Oh, there we go. I got you back. See, technology works. Awesome. Go ahead. Hey, hey listen, sometimes silence is golden. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm giving you a call. My, my question is a couple of part question. Unfortunately, okay. it can't be handled. It's just one statement. Um, not only New York State, but the entire nation is facing an incredible, uh, an incredible uh, illness that's been, well, I shouldn't call it an illness, an addiction set, set up of opiate painkillers. Yep. Um, we have, we have uh, I believe as a society, taken a step back and instead of having, uh, and what, when we're saying we're trying to prevent and do preventative measures in order to stop um, opiate issues uh, and Narcon not being preventative. Yes, it prevents death, but that does not prevent the problem. Um, there are there are many more. What's your uh, question, man? You 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 are so preaching on. to me. Don't preach to me. Tell me what you tell me what your question is. Uh, no, okay, yeah, I, I understand. But right. so, um, but my question is, how are we going to now take funds from the government instead of uh, investing in opportunities and situations such as rehabilitation centers that are intact now mm -hmm. that haven't been working? What changes can we make? Yep. And what changes are going to be made, yep. especially in educating our children? Yep. I get it completely. And one of the first things to do is to change how Oasis works. In New York State, we have a, another board, which is what we always have, a board that, does, that no one runs, called Oasis. I forgot what it stands for, but it basically is the group of people who decide what works to cure you of your addiction. And it decides what's right and what's wrong. Again, how in the world does someone in Albany know that that's right or wrong? How do they know? It's impossible. Instead, how about we let anyone who has an idea try? We have an epidemic, right? Uh, one of the industries I talk about all the time is vaping. There are some people who've used yeah. vaping to stop their addiction. Now, is that everyone? Of Correct. course not. But if that's 1%, good, then let's take that 1%. And if someone else uses marijuana, good, let's use that. So there are several issues. The first thing is letting Oasis be what it should be, which is a clearinghouse for information. That's what Oasis should be, a clearinghouse for information, a warehouse of data that I'm totally happy with. And people who want to fix this problem should be to go there and get real data so they can try to fix this problem, number one. Number two, there are tons of organizations that voluntarily want to fix this problem. And they have to go through Oasis instead of just doing it. So let them do it. Third, make marijuana legal. I can't tell you how important that is. Just make it legal. There are a lot of people in this, in this world, this nation, who are going to prescription opioids because they believe it's the right answer. Most people, 80% of people who are uh, addicts to this day, heroin, crack, whatever, started through some type of prescription medication. These aren't bad people on the run trying to steal stuff. These are regular people who got in trouble. They made a mistake, and now they're screwed. But if they would have had another option, like marijuana or cannabis or some other thing like that, they probably would have used that instead. And they wouldn't be addicted, and they wouldn't be smoking crack or shooting heroin or doing, the, doing meth, whatever's the problem now. So how about make marijuana legal? But I have to go even one step further. How about instead of saying, here's painkillers and it's okay, saying, here's painkillers, they're addictive. And when you have a problem, go here because you might be addicted. That's a problem. Again, this goes right back to my old thing, shine a light on it. What we don't do is we make addiction shameful. We make addiction a bad thing. And when we do that, everyone's ashamed of it. They don't tell anybody. So when someone's addicted, they hide it. They hide and they hide. When they need their family and friends most is when they walk away from them. Go ahead. All right. Excellent, Larry. Uh, that's, 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 ex that's excellent. A lot that we want to hear, uh, uh, especially, uh, especially me and my wife. We are so... Uh, 
I, I'm a survivor. I, mm-hmm. I was an ill person who went out west cured with cannabis. Yep. And restrictions, obviously, my, my mantra, honestly, is I'm not geographically ill. Wherever I am, I have the same illness. Yes. And I just think that I think that here on the East Coast, we need to catch up. Uh, we need to catch up with what's going on, in, yep. especially in the medical cannabis community, and have a huge, strong medical cannabis policy here. Because, Absolutely. Listen, uh, uh, unfortunately, because we're taught in school that cannabis is the devil's lettuce, it's, it's, hor- it's the horrible. It's horrible. Because we're that. not the 16 year old nice. kids that just want to light and fire up a joint. Nice. Cannabis is much more than just something we smoke. I agree. And that's all I really got to say. My name's Pete Yapel again. Uh, we're really, me and my wife will stand behind you, uh, uh, as well as our group Solidarity Over Separation. We're a human I love rights it. group here in New York. And as well as our radio station, Can We Talk 420 Radio. I and love we'll support it. You right to the- I got to be on your radio show now. Why Why may not have me on? I'm going to call you up. Put me on. My, I will have you on. We just, my wife actually saw this link to your show today. And um, there we, we, go. we were really interested in hearing. And Perfect. I'm honestly ju- jumping on and getting your viewpoint. But we'll, we would love, love to have you on. Perfect. I'll shoot you an email and we'll set that up. Sounds good. Thanks, Peter. Have a great night. All righty. Thank you. All right. So um, do we have any questions we want to take from oh, yeah. the uh, – go ahead. Yeah, we got questions. Go ahead. So Richard has an awesome success story, okay. um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gloss over that. I have it saved so you can read it later. Okay. But he asks um, – well, he says it's getting harder and harder to be successful and invest in business in mm-hmm. New York. How can you help young people like me be incentivized to stay in New York? Yeah, this it's a couple of things. One of them is do not do what Cuomo wants to do, which is change our income tax to a payroll tax. That's the first step. Don't do that. That's a really bad idea. Here's what I, as a consultant, when people start new businesses and they say, I want to hire somebody. I said, that's great. I said, now the punishment begins. That is literally what I say. Now the punishment begins. New York state begins to punish you the second you hire somebody. They assume you're a bad person. They assume you're lying. They assume whatever you're saying is wrong. And they start sending you the uh, notes that you owe them money. You literally, and this is, I'm not making this up. The second of the business, you will start getting notes from New York State saying you owe them money. You will have to fight them and say, no, I don't. Give it to your accountant if you have an accountant. And he'll have to say, no, it's not true. And you'll be fighting them immediately. You will fight New York State the second you start to hire somebody. And that sounds crazy. But if you started a business here, you know it's true. So the first thing is don't do that. That's number one. Number two, instead of making rules, like we had this great startup New York thing, If you come to New York and you start a business, you'll get this. If, 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 95 ifs, so almost no one actually uh, was able to do it unless you were a crony capitalist. You actually couldn't get on the program. So no one was helped. How about instead do a couple things? I have an idea. Number one, how about people who are out of prison, if they, if you hire them, you get a massive tax deduction for the first year. Massive tax deduction. Anyone who is underprivileged in whatever way you want to make it, you hire them the first year or two, you decide what makes sense. I'm not sure if it's a year or two yet. You, you get a massive break on taxes, payroll tax, income tax, massive break. Why? Larry, if we do that, then they'll just hire them for a year and then hire someone else. Good. Oh my God. They would be a rotating place where people get experience who came out of jail. What an awesome idea. I hope someone's business model is exactly that. All they do is hire prisoners for a year or two and then get rid of them and hire the next ex-prisoner. That'd be amazing. That'd be awesome. Again, people would have a chance at, at a second chance. So creating people who are hard to hire, giving them a break is the first option. The second option is respecting the new business owner. Whatever business owner they are, not assuming they're a bad guy. So the bad things don't come at you right away. We assume you're a good guy. That may seem silly. But administrators have to understand that. Administrators in New York State do not see a difference. They just see it's the law, punish. Well, if you're sending these notes to a company that has an HR, to a company that has an accounting department, no big deal. They can handle it easily. But when you're a solopreneur, when you're a one or two person shop and you get those notes, you lose half a day on that. Maybe more because your brain goes away because you're afraid of the government. You begin to get punished. The government should stop being seen as an adversary. And that is a cultural issue that doesn't exist in New York State, and it needs to. Got to go for a break. I'll finish this up. We're after break. Tony, soon. I just want to call in. Please go ahead. For, uh, sorry, 877-480-4120. It's Larry Sharp at the Governor's House. 
You are listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you a conscious co creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you feeling unhappy with your body, shape, or size? Ever feel out of control with food? I'm Elizabeth from Nourish the Soul, and on this show, you will uncover the root to these imbalances and discover a permanent solution to having a healthy relationship to food and your body. Join us every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Larry Sharp back at the governor's house running for governor of New York. LarrySharp.com. L A R R Y S H A R P E. E makes it special. LarrySharp.com. If you want to know more about what I'm doing and who I am, if you want to call in 877 480 4120. Talking about education and also race. Yes, I mix them. Brian, another question. Yeah, we're going to take you back to education. Haley asks, does the government have any role in mandating, that's a kind of a high-level question here, any role in mandating that a child must receive education? If so, how can school dress codes not be in direct contradiction to the First Amendment? Hmm, good, that's a good, that's a good tough question. I haven't heard that one before. You know, the idea of government mandating education, I know for many libertarians is a tough one. I get that, it's a tough one. It's not a battle I'm ready to fight. Simply not. I'm not prepared to fight that battle. In theory, you are correct. Government should not be telling you each individual what to do. But in practice, it's simply a battle I'm not ready to fight. There are so many other issues in this country, so many issues in this state. Let it go. I'm not going to touch that now. So uh, I, I know for some of you lib hardcore libertarians, you're mad at me now. But I'm just being very forward. It's just simply that it's not worth it. We have the mandate. It's there. We'll deal with it 30 years from now, 20 years from now, once we turn the country around in the first place. Not, not, not something. Of all the damage that's being done, it's fine. We'll deal with that one later. I'd rather, I'd rather provide more school choice than anything else. School dress codes, another great idea. Yes, I think the idea of a school dress code should be just like anything else. If it's harming someone else, harming them in some way, shape, or form, I get it. But dress codes, I'm not sure that's the right answer. I would rather allow schools to decide what their dress codes are versus a uh, government deciding what their dress codes are. Right. I would rather I would rather the school say we want to have a uniform. If you want to come to our school, you have to wear a uniform and you can choose to or not. I think it's better if the schools decide. And that's kind of the way it is now. I think I'm, I'm OK with that idea. If schools decide I'm not OK with government saying we're scared. So therefore, you can't wear anything. And I know schools come up with. Let me go to my, my biggest pet peeve, which is, I think, where you're going. The idea of no tolerance policy, zero tolerance policies. They're always bad. They never work. They always make things worse. The problem is if someone says, wait a minute, Larry, because I don't know whether this what's, what's on this shirt is good or bad, now no one can wear anything with letters on their shirts. Yes, those are the type of, of actual rules that pop up in schools. And I get what we, we you're, we you're dealing with. But I would instead simply allow the schools to create their own policies. It, it, it's just not, it's not a huge issue for me either way right now. Hope that was, hope that was okay, Haley. Go ahead. All right. Oh, hold on. I have my oh. daughter here. Do you care, Barbara? No, it's not really that important. Whatever happens, happens. Um, my dress code Smart is that girl. important to me. 
I, ra- I care more about my education more than anything else. There we go. From, from the mouth of an actual student. Perfect. Go ahead. Perfect. So Bobby asks, any ideas as governor how you will, he said would, but I'm saying will, get the state legislature on board with your plans? These are the people who want to regulate Tide Pods. How do we convince them less regulation is better? By the way, um, Bobby, Bob, my brother, the story I told earlier about me going to school, the class I went to, was Bob's class. Bob is the oldest friend I have, um, and I feel horrible because his birthday was four days ago, five days ago, and I forgot. I'm sorry, Bob. Happy birthday. I did it, at least I did it all, I did it in front of everybody at least. I made up for it. I didn't forget you. I was crazy busy. I was in Atlanta. It was crazy. That's a BS excuse, I know. I should have said happy birthday. I apologize. Anyway, yes, Bobby is, is my friend of now um, almost, hold on, 35 years? More? 40 years almost? Yes. So when he asks the question, I'm going to answer it. It's a valid question, and it's going to be tough, but there's an advantage to this. When I become governor, I'm going to have an assembly completely against me. I know this. I'm going to be the only libertarian in the room. They're all going to be against me. I got it. The advantage is... They won't know what to do with themselves, and they'll be attacking me all day, all night, all the time. With that in mind, I will be able to have the bully pulpit. I'll be able to get out there and talk and talk and talk. In case you guys didn't notice, I like talking. So I'll be able to talk and talk and talk and use the bully pulpit. I will not convince them that more that more or less regulation is better. I won't. What I'll be able to do is create air cover for them. And how I start that is what, what I'm calling... Um, the office, <clears throat> sorry, um, what I'm calling is uh, the office of the pardon, right? That means what am I going to do? What am I going to do to say, you know what? I want to pardon people and let people out of prison for crimes that weren't important, right? Crimes that weren't a big deal. They weren't, they weren't violent. I'm not going to wait till my, you know, a day before I get out of office. I'm going to start pardoning within the first three months. The first three months I begin to pardon. When that happens, Here's what I know. If I pardon 100 people who were convicted of possession of marijuana, which is not a crime. I know it is a crime, but it's not a crime. So they get, they get out of jail. One of them is going to do something stupid. One of them is going to rob a store, beat somebody up, sell some drugs, whatever. Do something stupid. They're going to. And when they do, the press is going to point to me and say, see, Governor Sharp, you let Bob Jones out, and now he robbed the store. You're a bad governor. And I'm going to say, get in line. Everyone says I'm a bad governor. I'm not impressed. Get in line. And I'm pardoning another 100 in another month. I don't care. And I'll keep doing it. And when 99 out of 100 don't do anything wrong, I'll be saving the lives of 99 because one guy made something wrong. There's something wrong. That's what our country is all about. Our country was found an idea that it is better, better for a guilty person to go free than an innocent person to be imprisoned. That's called life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, what we're built upon. We've forgotten that. I will reinstate that. Once that happens, all of a sudden, the, the assembly people go, oh, wait a minute. We don't lose our jobs if something goes wrong? No, because Governor Sharp's taking all the heat. He's doing all the air cover. But not just that. I will begin to take certain things and, I can't say not enforce, make, their, make, make the priority of their enforcement a whole lot less. A whole lot less. So all of a sudden, no one's really enforcing the walking your dog license, the braiding your hair license, which is required in New York State. So now that doesn't get, all of a sudden, no one's enforcing that. And someone's going to braid someone's hair too tight, and they're going to cry. And when they cry, all of a sudden, they're going to go get sued and say, someone braided my hair too tight. Did they have a license to braid hair? No, Governor Sharp's evil. And I'm going to say, I don't care. I want to give people who have the ability to make money with their own labor by braiding hair or walking dogs or whatever that case may be, to go do that. And when they do that, and I go, I don't care, all of a sudden the assembly says, wait a minute, I can actually repeal a law and I don't get hammered? Yes, that's the office of the repeal. So an office of the pardon and an office of the repeal and the bully pulpit, this will take at least one year, at least a year, maybe two. But by year two, we will all of a sudden start seeing things getting repealed. To include, by the way, the SAFE Act. The SAFE Act will also be repealed. All these rules and regulations will begin to fall back. My focus on regulation, 
And this goes back to the first question the guy asked earlier today about the first question, the question before the break about how to help small businesses. My first priority in regulation is not EPA, is not big business, it's small business regulation. That is my number one priority when it comes to regulation relief, when it comes to getting these regulations off of the little guy. It is small business regulation, my number one priority over everything else when it comes to regulation. If I get the, the, the boot of government off the back, off the neck of the little guy, he will grow and be a big guy. And when he's a big guy, he can handle regulations better. That's, that's what they do. In fact, they write them all anyway, so it doesn't really matter. The point is, once I get it off of the little guy, now he will grow. So I hope that answered your question. All right, guys, I want to say thank you so much for this evening. LarrySharp.com. If you like what I'm doing, you got to support me. You got to go on LarrySharp.com and give me some money. I'm not joking. I'm going to keep doing this. Have to do this. I'm bleeding here. When I'm here, I'm not with my family, except tonight I scammed. And, oh, and I'm also not making money. I'm a consultant. If I'm not in front of people, I'm not making money. I need you to support me so I can do this, so I can get out here, get the ads I need, hire the people I need, travel the way I have to so I can get upstate, Get the votes that we need to make real impact. Happy birthday, Bobby. Have a great night, guys. I will see you guys next week at the Governor's House. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network.